my messages are all written outline form. They have nice conclusions. And sometimes, just trying to get the word out, I forget about how nice a conclusion I had. <laughs> the last three weeks of study, we were talking about, about uh, God and hands-on, hands-off type of thing and intervention and sovereignty. And uh, in, case, in case you want to know what that conclusion to that series was, <laughs> I decided that instead of saying that God's hands are on or that God's hands are off, God's hands are in, I concluded that it's not intervention, but indwelling and empowerment. And it's not sovereign manipulation, but it's uh, now unto him that's able to establish you. And uh, that's, you have to go back to three weeks and study those to find out what that all means. But <laughs> that was my conclusion. I didn't even share it with you. But we get to move on to something new, and actually there is a real break in, a, in the book of Philippians here as you come to chapter 3. Um, let, me, let me read to you the first seven verses, even though we're, we'll just study verses 1 and 2 today, but uh, you'll see where it's going, and we'll talk about even beyond verse 7 uh, as we introduce this chapter. Philippians chapter 3, verse 1 says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord, to write the same thing unto you, to me indeed, is not grievous. But unto you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Let's just stop right there and pray. Our Father, we do pray that our minds and hearts, attention certainly, would be uh, focused in on this passage of Scripture today and that we'd heed the warning that's here, and, uh, and Father, that we might um, be protected by your word, as well as informed and built up and established in the faith. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Now, in uh, approaching this chapter, I want to say some things about the chapter at, at first, and what I want you to realize is the theme of the book of Philippians. Remember, back in chapter 1, verse 10, approving things that are excellent. And uh, I say that because if you consider the, the three ways, the three things that are going to be addressed in this chapter, it starts out, you can see in verse 2 there, beware of dogs. And that's really the title of today's message, beware of dogs. Uh, but anyhow, it starts out with a warning in the first seven verses. And, uh, and then, then it, it, it goes to the subject of attaining unto the resurrection. Just look at verse 11. It says, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection uh, of the dead. J. Sidlow Baxter calls this chapter the goal of the believer's life. And it all it centers about the resurrection and, and the judgment seat of Christ uh, uh, in resurrection, the rewards that we'll receive. Uh, and then the last part of the chapter is, a, is uh, uh, telling us to follow Paul's example and to mark others. Uh, look at verse 15. It says, let us therefore, as many as, have, as, no, no, verse 17. Brethren, be ye followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. So you have in this chapter a warning, and then it goes, it's going to talk about attaining unto the resurrection, and then Paul's going to be the example so that you don't get off track, and to mark those who are off track so that you don't follow them. So when you, look, when you look at that as a whole there, that one of the things that I said when we introduced the whole book of Philippians, and even we spent a lot of time in chapter 2 because of this, is there is an undertone all the way through the book of Philippians at, about the judgment seat of Christ, about the rapture and being presented before the Lord. And, uh, and with that, keep in, if you understand that that is there and you see that it's going to come up again in chapter 3, that should give you a little bit more purpose to heed the warning that the chapter begins with when it says beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. Because in light of the rapture and the high calling of God, if you don't heed this warning, it'll have an effect on your eternal soul. Now, I'm not saying it'll damn you to hell. If you're saved, you're saved. You have eternal life. 
but it's going to affect your reward in, 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 at the rapture, after the rapture at the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, and then there is uh, kind of off the, it's the, the context is to the believer, but there's a warning here that there's a lot of lost people that are following these dogs, these evil workers, these con, con, uh, con, concisions, the person that he's calling concision, and, and those people will actually hinder someone from ever getting saved in the first place, so they could damn their soul. But as far as a believer, us as believers, to heed this, it is important when we're standing at the judgment seat of Christ. I say that so that you keep that in mind and just not look at three different sections and realize how he starts and where he's going and then, then the pattern that, that he leaves us with. So, so that, that's the chapter. That's what we're going to be covering in the chapter. Now, even in the section that we're first going to be introducing, the, the warnings, the bewares that are here, there's three parts to that. In verses 1 and 2, there is three dangerous deceivers. See, even the concision there, and even the one that talks about the dogs and the evil workers, the, those are groups of people. So there's, there's three dangerous deceivers that we're warned about. In verse 3, look at verse 3, it says, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Verse 3 then Tells, you, tells us who we are, and then three things we do because of who we are. One of those is a don't do, but you get the idea of that. And then, uh, and then in verses 4 through 7, then, is a proper evaluation and choice. And you can see that in verse 7 when it says, But those things which are gained to me, I, count, I counted loss for Christ. Remember, approving things are excellent is, the, is uh, the theme of the book of, of Philippians. And certainly, uh, when Paul does this evaluation, this is the proper evaluation that he's come to and choice. And, and so that, that's what the chapter is going to, or those first seven verses are going to take us to. So let's start in verses 1 and 2 on the three dangerous deceivers. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. And then the beware. We'll get the beware in just a moment. But it's good to stop and realize that before you got to verse 2, at least he started out with positive. And, and interesting to me that he starts out with the word finally. Now I want you to look at where that word is in relation to the book. How many chapters are there in the book of Philippians? There's four chapters to the book of Philippians. The beginning of chapter 3, he says, finally. Now, let me say it without joking the first time. <laughs> that Paul, when he says, finally, that's telling you that when you get to chapter 3 of Philippians, he's already concluding the book. He said some things that he wanted to say and write about, and now he is, I mean, that's not a joke, if finally he is bringing his conclusion, and his conclusion will run two more chapters. So, so that, that is the legitimate part of the word finally. Uh, the other part of that is to realize that he's only halfway with what he had to say, and he said finally. Will you remember that when I say finally, my brethren? <laughs> that I'm only halfway through with what I want to say. <laughs> he can do it, I can do it, right? Okay. But he does say finally, my brethren. And what he says is, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Talk about positive. <laughs> rejoice in the Lord. To, to write the same things to you, it, to me, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. When he says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord, look at chapter 4 and verse 1. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Uh, oh, actually, verse 4 is where I wanted. <laughs> Rejoice in the Lord, chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. You think Paul's got some encouragement that he wants to pass along? This is, Paul is really uh, reproving the, the, the Philippian saints for, some, for, for the seed of discourse. The seed has not blossomed in this, in this book like it did at, at Corinth. But the seed is there that could cause problems. He's going to mention some people in chapter 4 that the problems. He, he's already talked about us striving together for the faith of the gospel. And that is the goal, and, and these saints were doing that. But there's some things there that needed to be dealt with, because if they don't approve things that are excellent, then, then a little leaven's going to leaven the whole lump. 
So, so he says some things in correction, but he reminds them to, to rejoice in the Lord. And we'll, we'll say more about that when we get to chapter 4, verse 4, because he repeats it twice, and, and so he has some things for us to consider about rejoicing in the Lord. For right now, I just want you to realize that when he says that, he wants your eyes focused on the Lord. The concept. There are some days that you go through life, and there's just not a lot to rejoice over because just everything turns sour all day long. And that can get you down. Notice where Paul said to rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. That never changes. What you have in Christ, the riches that you have in Christ, you need to value that and realize that no matter what happens in life, whatever comes your way, whatever trials you face, whatever your emotions want to pity yourself about, the Bible tells you to rejoice, but tells you how you can do that. Rejoice in the Lord. He's never going to let you down. His promises are never going to be taken away. His promises are always true, and they're eternal. So you can rejoice in the Lord. And, and so Paul would have you direct your, your mind, your heart, uh, your spirit, your eyes to the Lord and, and keep them there. Now, what you have in Christ, uh, a long time ago, and we're, you know, we could take the time now in, in order for you to fulfill that, is you have to have some kind of concept. How can you rejoice in the Lord unless you know what you have in the Lord? Well, one time we had a Bible study, well, several times I taught through this series, and, and I, I put down a list of 35 things that happen to you the moment you get saved. And they're really just a list of all of who God has made you, what He's made you in Christ the moment you got saved. Other people have come along and made a list. The last list I saw was 100. And so there's, in fact, when I look at my list, the first one says, saved by God's plan, promise, and provision. Well, you could call that four then, couldn't you? <laughs> or three. <laughs> so anyhow, there's a way that you can multiply the list. But I just want you to hear the list. And some of them you'll remember. Some of them are basic. And some of them will, you'll stick in your mind right now so that later on when you want to get sorry about something and, and, uh, and, and not rejoice, that you can think about something that you'll remember to rejoice about. And, uh, and then maybe they'll prompt you to go and make your own list. But, but when it says rejoice in the Lord, here's what you have in Christ. First of all, you're saved. I'll just stop, make them all short here. But, but with saved, there's another, the opposite side of that. That in being saved, you're judged, condemned, and crucified with Christ. Whew, that's over with. Isn't that nice? You're dead to the law, you're alive unto God. You're quickened, you're made alive. Made nigh unto God. Built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. A possession of Christ. We've already stressed that in the book of Philippians. Ye are Christ. You belong to Him. A partaker of God's promise. Your sins have been propitiated. You're atoned by the blood. Declared righteous, justified, reconciled, redeemed, forgiven all trespasses. Baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. Positionally sanctified. Spiritually uh, circumcised. You're going to see that here in that verse, in the next couple verses. Glorified, accepted in the beloved, adopted into sonship, delivered from the power of darkness, translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son, heir of God's promise, joint heir with Christ. Given unlimited access to God, given and indwelt by the Holy Spirit, made complete in Christ, made one of God's peculiar people, an object of God's love and grace, light in the Lord, blessed with all spiritual blessings, became an inheritance of God. Not only do you get inheritance from God, you became an inheritance of God. That's a deep one for you to study. Given a heavenly position and citizenship, eternally united in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Rejoice in the Lord. That's a lot to rejoice in. And that can't change. None of that can be taken away from you. So Paul starts out warning you, first of all, rejoice in the Lord. Get your eyes directed there, and the things of the earth will grow strangely dim. So, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Then he says, to write the same thing unto you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Here we go, men, for the men's table. To write the same things. What same things? Don't answer me. I'm, in my own thinking, I'm, it, I, it's, not, it's not something I even tried to search out. But the same thing. Is it the same thing he said when he was there? Is it the same thing he said to someone or wrote to someone else? Uh, is it the same thing that he wrote in chapters 1 and 2 and he's repeating it in chapter 3? Either way, 
It doesn't matter. The idea there is Paul is repeating some things that, that they have been taught and they should know. And, you know, you come to church, we're, we're studying the book of Acts, it just hit my mind. And, and the, the, the people at Athens spent their time in doing nothing but to hear some new thing. I hope you don't always come to church to hear, what is Tom going to have that's something new? The Bible tells me, though, it does tell me, uh, taking it from what the apostles were told, to, that God's word is like a treasure that you reach in and pull out things new and old. You, you, ought, you got to always go back over the old things. I mean, I told you I made that list of 35 things a long time ago. It's still as new as ever, isn't it? And it needs to be gone back over because you forget all those things because you can't keep them all in your mind because we're forgetful people. And there are some times you study the Bible and you see something new for the first time. Not the end of the world, but the, <laughs> the dating of the end of the world, things like that. Not like that. <laughs> but actually true things from the Word of God. But, but but Paul, what he's talking here, to write the same thing to you. It's the things that they've been taught, the things that they should know. But he says, to me is not grievous. And, you know, it was a hard thing for Paul to write a letter. And, and, but he's in prison, nothing else to do anyhow, so he writes the, this letter. But, but anyhow, it, it's not grievous for him to go over these things and keep going over those things. He says, but for you it is safe. Paul, what Paul is writing, he is writing for your safety. Now, that's really important to keep in mind. You know, the things that are valuable are the, the only things that you need to keep safe. Isn't that true? I mean, Mike Berry never locks his car. It's not valuable. It's not worth anything. He don't care if anybody steals it. <laughs> I just know he never locks his car, in case you want to steal a car out there. <laughs> I remember one time meeting him at a restaurant for breakfast. It was winter. I come out, he says, your car's running. He said, yeah, I didn't want it to get cold while I was in there. And that's before they had the remotes to start the car. The whole time he ate breakfast, he left his car running, the keys in the ignition, running outside, the door unlocked. <laughs> well, uh, that's Mike for you. But the, the point, <laughs> the more important point is, is Paul's going to say some things that are for your safety, but the things that, that need protected are things that are valuable. So, the, so when we talk about rejoicing in the Lord and the, and, uh, and, and the things that He's going to protect you from, there is some val there's some valuable things that you have that need protected. And before we even get into what those are, notice where, he, where they're going to be protected at. To write the same things unto you, to me is not grievous, but for you it is safe. It is safe for Paul to do what? Right. Not just teach you the things that he has already taught them, but to write them. Where is the safety going to be found for you to, be, to find what dogs are, what evil workers are, what the concisions are, what the, what the riches are that people are going to try to rob you from? Where are you going to find all that? Paul wrote it down. As soon as I looked at that verse, I realized there's another verse of Scripture that proves that God's intent... For you and me in this age was to take his truths and put it in writing and preserve it down through generations and have it in English language for us to study and to learn and to be warned from. The Bible isn't going to lead us astray. It is the truth of God's word. It is the truth. It is God's word. That's the point. So it's not going to lead. It, you got to worry about someone else coming along saying something else. It's the Bible that's going to protect you. What's written down is going to be God's safety net for you, for the deceivers that are going to try to lead you astray. So, boy, when you have that attitude toward the Bible, you're not going to be changing the Bible or think you got some Bible with some mistakes in it. You better believe the Bible is right and it's going to correct everything everybody else says. Otherwise, you have no safety net. So. The, value, the, the safety for the valuables is in God's Word, but it's also, when Paul writes it, if you don't do what verse 2 says, beware, it's in God's Word for you to have that written in your heart, in your mind, for safekeeping. God's Word has said a lot of things that would have kept you safe and out of a lot of trouble in life had you read the verse before you got in all that trouble. And I'll let you apply that any way you want, because you know what you've done in life and you know what the Bible said that you should have done and you didn't do, and if you would have done that, one of the things I commonly heard is, boy, if I would only got saved when I was, and to go back in the past. Some people get saved, saved real late in life, and for the first time start turning to the Bible and realizing what life's all about, and really, time-wise, they're at the end of their life, physically, 
beginning of their spiritual life. So, but anyhow, so God's Word, when Paul writes it down, it's written in the Scriptures, but it's also written down so it can be put in your heart for safekeeping. The truths that we're talking about, the Bible talks about God's Word, especially the dispensation of grace. It's called the riches of God's grace. Ephesians uh, 1, 7. Then, and then, then it even Paul prays in Ephesians 1, 8 that you might understand the riches of God's grace to you. But then when you get over to Ephesians chapter 2, he talks about the exceeding riches of his grace. And then you get over to chapter 3 of Ephesians and he talks about the unsearchable riches of Christ. Meaning you couldn't have dug them out of the Old Testament, they weren't there, but they've been given to Paul and he wrote them down, again writing in chapter 3 of Ephesians. He wrote those things down so that you might know what was the unsearchable, what is the unsearchable riches of Christ. That is unsearchable in the Old Testament, now revealed in Paul's writings, so that you can read and find out the riches of God's grace to you. Now that's what someone's going to try to steal. They're going to try to steal something that's rich. And wherever there's riches, there's always thieves waiting to take away from you your enjoyment of those riches. Now, I, I, I said that in a certain way, if you think about it. That wherever there's riches, there are thieves waiting to take away from you your enjoyment of them, of those riches. I mean, riches are for enjoyment, right? Thieves don't always steal to take it for themselves. I mean, I would, I would be glad to share with a thief the riches of God's grace. He don't have to steal it from me. I'll share it with him. <laughs> They're eternal. There's enough to go around. So, but, but thieves come around, and what they're stealing is not stealing it for themselves. They're just stealing it away from you so you can't enjoy it. And really, that, you, know, you think about it, take it in the monetary way. You know, you have a million bucks in the bank or somehow, and you're thinking about how you can enjoy that money, and you found out someone had a way to hack your bank account, and the money's gone, and the bank's not going to cover you, and you just lost it all. Well, someone might have gained it, but you know what you lost? The enjoyment of what you were planning to do with that money. Exactly. Well, we're not talking money. We're talking about something far more richer than that. We're talking about the riches of God's grace. But there are thieves that are out there to steal from you to take away your enjoyment of those riches. So when Paul, he first tells you to rejoice in the Lord, and then he says, it's not grievous for me to write this, but for you it's safe. So this is, here, lock this away, keep the safe. Here, here's how you can be safe. Verse 2, beware of dogs, beware of e uh, uh, evil workers, beware of the concision. So, when you get to this, now you got the negative. You got the warning, of, you got the positive with the warning there in verse 1. And then now here's a warning, beware of. And certainly it starts out in that first one, beware of dogs. But, but beware itself. That, that stands there in that verse. And you know, if you came across a place and you've seen this sign, they usually put it in bold black letters with, with bold black outlining the word danger. And, and you come up to a fence and the word danger is there or beware or warning, we usually stop and look at that. I, in my mind when I say that, I, I immediately picture one of these fences that either it's one of these electrical places where they got all this electricity going into this, these big old mechanisms, Rich can know what they are, transformers of some kind, and they put a gate around and they put that warning sign on there and you heed that warning because physically it's in your best interest to listen to that. You don't, you don't dare say, oh, I think I'll jump the fence and touch one of those things. <laughs> or, warning, minefield. Ah, that's a shortcut, I'll try it anyhow. <laughs> now, wh when we see those warning signs, they're there to, to alert us, and when it comes to the physical, we're prone to listen to it because we want to live a little bit longer. But you know, when it comes to the spiritual... There it is. Warning, warning, warning. Three times in that verse 2 there. Beware three times in that verse there. But when it comes to the spiritual, people don't give it the same importance. They don't think about it as an endangerment to their spiritual life. And it's standing there three times telling you there's a warning here that, that we need to give the same attention to in, in this warning. There's warnings on the pack of cigarettes, isn't there? 
used to be everyone smoked cigarettes. It used to be a Christian thing. Christians don't smoke and lost people smoke. And, and we know that none of that was true in the first place anyhow. <laughs> Especially if you come from down south, they, 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 they smoke, but they don't go mix bathing. They're swimming in the same water beach with men and women. Anyhow, not to get into any of that, but I'm thinking about the warning that the, the government finally puts a, a pack of cigarettes and decides that these things are really dangerous, and because they're so dangerous, they actually made a law that the cigarette packs have to have a danger sign on them, a warning to people of what, of what they can cause. I, I started thinking about that, looking at this verse, thinking, you know what? Every Bible, new translation that comes out from the wrong text, <laughs> ought to have a warning on there saying, warning, the teachings in this book may be harmful to your eternal soul. Also, the things that we're going to learn in this passage about what Paul would warn us about it, it are things that churches, whether they be fundamental churches or liberal churches, have ignored and don't pay any attention to and don't teach God's word rightly divided. Yeah, right. And as a result of that, even with good intentions, if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, you can use the Bible and be robbed of your riches and grace. Yeah, they, they do it all the time, putting people under the law. So that any legalistic church, or any church that doesn't rightly divide the word of truth, ought to be required to put a sign in front of their church that says, Warning! The teachings in this building may be harmful to your eternal soul. Because that's exactly what Paul's doing in those verses. Now, they won't put that sign there, so God put it in here for you. This is for your safety. And the first thing he says is, beware of dogs. Now, if you saw a sign that said, beware of dogs, first thing you're going to think about is, yep, they bite. In fact, you probably saw the guy, the kid on the news in our neighborhood, he bit by the dog, the same dog twice now. <laughs> the, the dog neighbor got out, he's right in our neighborhood, but the other dog got over the fence or leaped up on the fence and grabbed the kid as he ran by, and really, first time, just scarred him all up. He's walking with, that was a month, year ago, whatever it was, it was some time ago. <laughs> Walked past the same house, same dog, did it to him again. The dog's just out for him. And uh, whether they have the sign, beware of dog or not, that dog got him even through the fence. But, but when we say beware of dogs, certainly we, th we, th we understand that dogs bite. Well, we're not talking dogs, you know that. That in this warning here, there's a, there's a group of people that the Apostle Paul is referring to as dogs. And there's a warning in the Bible about what they can do. Um, now, for the most part, when we study the Bible, we realize that the Gentiles were called dogs. Now, if you're not familiar with this passage, you need to write Matthew chapter 15, but we go to it quite often to teach right division, because in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when Jesus Christ came, the Bible says that he came uh, unto the, to the circumcision, uh, came unto the Jews to minister, I can't even quote Romans now. He came unto his own, <laughs> and his own sought him not. <laughs> he, uh, anyhow, he, came, he was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God can, to, uh, uh, promise unto the fathers. But he, Jesus Christ, when he was here, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is his ministry to the nation of Israel to fulfill the promises God made to Israel. That's important for you to know because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus Christ was not ministering to the nations, the Gentiles. Amen. Then to make that point, in Matthew chapter 15, Jesus Christ come, is near Tyre and Sidon, he's near that coastline, and a lady comes out of Canaan and desires that he would heal her daughter because she's vexed with the devil. She's a Gentile Canaanite woman who comes to the Lord, and when you read that passage, it says she's asking the Lord to heal the daughter, and the Lord won't even answer her. I mean, the lady's talking, heal my daughter, heal my daughter, the Lord won't even pay any attention to her. So she goes to the disciples, and he says, have your Lord heal my daughter. And so they go to him and say, can you get her off our back? <laughs> and he says to them, I'm not sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then he says, it's not fit, meat, to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. Now there is a Gentile, a dog. And she answered the Lord herself. She said, yea, Lord, that's true. 
but the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table, from the children's table. And he says, great is your faith, be it as you, as you have asked. And her daughter was healed. Because under Israel's program, a Gentile can be blessed through the nation of Israel. After Israel is blessed, then the Gentiles get the crumbs that fall from their table. Gentiles were called dogs. You know, the Bible don't say a lot of good things about dogs. Now this is, this can be a little hurtful to some people here. My, my, my sister just had to give up her dog, but not to death, to her, to her daughter. So she, we're talking, and I understand the emotion. I remember Joyce one time come into church when I think her dog passed away. But she knew me, and she says, well, I know that, I, I forget how it is, but she knew she wasn't getting any sympathy from me that her dog died. <laughs> but she was talking about how close you can get to a dog. I happened to get an email this week from a brother in Christ who's been up 41 hours because the dog Buster died, or had to put him down, and, and he can't sleep. He says, is anything you can say to me? I'm thinking, boy, you asked the wrong person. <laughs> but I, it took me two days, but I put some thoughts together and wrote him an email and, and, and tried to say some good things about how we can learn from animals, especially the loyalty of a dog and understanding the appreciation of that. But you know, when it comes to the Bible, I looked up all the verses about dogs. There's not one good verse about a dog. <laughs> the closest thing to it I found in Ecclesiastes 9, verse 4, that says, a living dog is better than a dead lion. <laughs> That's the best I found. <laughs> you know, the Lord said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, not to give, uh, give not that which is holy unto the dogs. And you remember how he follows that up? Neither cast your, your pearls, that's it, before swines. Takes a dog and a swine and puts them together. Why? The reason the Gentiles were called dogs is they were unclean, like a pig. They were cut off from God. They weren't God's people. And until God turned to them to sanctify them for his use, they were dogs. And so they were dogs in Israel's program, and in the age of grace, God has sanctified the Gentiles through the, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit out to the Gentiles. God is offering us salvation today. That's what the age of grace is about. But, but the point is, is that dogs were considered unclean. Look at a couple of verses. Come to Isaiah chapter 56. By the way, what if you spelled God backwards? <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> but so dogs must be the opposite of God. <laughs> Bible don't say anything good about dogs. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't help you today. <laughs> I know you love dogs, but that's because we're Gentiles, I guess. <laughs> In the flesh. <laughs> Isaiah 56, do I got you going there? Now here's a verse of scripture, Scoville had this marked, I thought, wow, look at that verse. In Isaiah 56 and verse 10, well, actually look at verse 1 first, it says, and this is Israel's program, so understand how it's being used, but it says in verse 1, Thus saith the Lord, Keep ye judgment and do justice, for my salvation is near to come, and my righteousness to be revealed. So, we're talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. He's going to come back in judgment and, and save the, the righteous in his coming. So the context of Isaiah 56 is the coming of the Lord. Now in light of the fact that he's coming in judgment, verse 10 says, His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. Sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. See, you don't want to be a dog. You know, when Paul says beware a dog, I mean, that, dogs, I mean, there's a, there's a whole list of what to be aware of right in that verse, isn't there? First of all, it's relating to people who should be watchmen who are sleeping. It's actually, the context would be ministers who are lazy dogs and asleep and not barking and warning the people. So, when... Primarily, when we're in, the, in, in that Philippians chapter 2, and he says, beware of dogs, beware of ministers. Gentile ministers, particularly. So, that, there's the warning there. 
Um, verse 11 says, Yea, they are greedy dogs, which can never have enough. Dog ever get done eating and leave some food in the bowl? Uh, unless you buy the cheap stuff, maybe. But, but especially you put good hamburger in there, they're not quitting no matter how much is in there. But that's... That, the Bible's warning you about this kind of a minister. A greedy guy taking everything for himself, robbing you for his own benefit. They are greedy dogs which never have enough, and they are, they are shepherds, he switches the analogy here, that cannot understand. They all look to their own way. Does that remind you what Paul said about Timothy? Yeah. The opposite of that? I have no man who will naturally care for your state, for all seek their own. But Timothy wasn't like the majority of people were. And so the warning is about the majority of the people who only seek their own way. Uh, one for his gain uh, from his quarter. Verse 12, Come ye, say they, I will fetch wine. I don't know about a dog doing that. We will fill ourselves with strong drink. And tomorrow we shall be, uh, 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 tomorrow shall be as this day, and much more abundant. What's the context of the chapter? The Lord's coming in judgment. And some guy saying, nah, don't worry about the Lord's coming. Just live, live for now. The opposite of what God would have them to do. So when it says, beware of dogs, it's warning of, of those kind of ministers that are going to do that. But, but the other part of that, if you just take dogs and how it's used in the Bible, look at the first usage. Uh, Exodus chapter 22. Now this is, this is, when I searched all the verses about dogs, this is almost the primary way, almost all, all the verses emphasize this fact about dogs. Uh, Exodus 21 and verse uh, 22, verse 31. It says, And ye shall be holy men unto me, neither shall ye eat any flesh that is torn of beasts in the field, ye shall not cast it to the dogs. Okay, you shall cast it to the dogs. Don't listen to the minister, especially if he's a Gentile. <laughs> but see what it is? What do you cast the dogs? Scraps. The whole point is dogs eat anything. When you read about dogs in the Bible, primarily it's, all, it's always about dogs eating things, licking blood, eating the flesh. In fact, the one that got me to thinking was, it's, uh, there's a warning where God warns, remember who Jezebel is in your Bible? She married Ahab, the king of Israel, but she was actually the daughter of the, of the prince uh, of, of Beth, uh, Beth, anyhow, the, uh, the priest of, Beth, of uh, Baal. And, and so she, when she married Ahab, got Ahab worshiping Baal rather than worshiping God, and the whole ten northern tribes of Israel brought in Baal worship and turned from God. God pronounced a judgment on her in 1 Kings chapter 21 that said that the dogs shall eat the flesh of Jezebel in Jezreel. And then when you read 2 Kings, it happened. They... The, she fell out of a window and the dogs came and ate her flesh. They came to bury her and she'd gone. The dogs ate her. The dogs eat even human flesh like that. So that, that's the primary way that the Bible talks about dogs. Well, come with me to Revelation chapter 2. Now this is again in Israel's prophetic program, but... Paul says, beware dogs, where well, we're learning from the scriptures how the dogs is used, in, especially not only in unclean Gentiles, but toward ministers that are not watching, are lazy dogs, and, and, ha and are turning people away from the truth rather than to the truth. So Revelation chapter 2, when it's the warnings that to the seven churches at the, at, at the time of the tribulation that's coming, it, it says in verse 20, he says, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest the woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce, seduce my servants, 
to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Well, we already seen dogs related to this woman. And here's someone in the future, a woman prophetess, that the church, back up in verse 18, and unto the angel of the church of, Thy uh, of Thyatira write these things. The church of Thyatira is going to allow this woman, a woman prophetess, to teach and seduce the saints into her false teaching and to eat things to offered and sacrificed idol. The idol that's going to be offered in the last days is the is the is the idol of the image of the beast. And they're going to be seduced by a false prophet who's going to come in among the believers and seduce them to do that. Verse 21 says, And I give her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and notice this, and them that commit adultery with her, they're going to be in the same bed together, into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Verse 23, And I will kill her children with death. Now wait a minute. If she's a great whore, cast in the bed along with everybody who follows her, what's the result of following her? The product is children who follow Baal. Children who worship the Antichrist. So that, that's why it says, I will kill her with death and the churches which know that I, uh, and all the churches which know that I am he, which searcheth the reins and, and, uh, and, and the hearts, I will give unto every one of you according to your works. And they're, they're going to warn, there's a warning about not taking the mark of the beast. But here's this woman Jezebel at the end who brought people into Gentile worship who people will do it again, and the Gentile worship will be the worship of the Antichrist. Those who follow her, and those who, the product, those who produce with her, their children are all condemned. Now look, look at the last verse, and then we've got to quit. Revelation chapter 22. Verse I'm always working on, because I don't quite understand how this stands at the end of the chapter of the book of Revelation. Gary and I talk about it all the time. But it says in verse 14, Revelation 22, Blessed are they that do his commandments, and they that, that have right to the tree of life. And that's why it's important to rightly divide the word of truth. There's some things they're commanded to do that they might have a right to the tree of life. You and I, we're, we're told to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. If you do anything other than that, you won't be saved, because that's what God requires of you. But the point is, Blessed are they which do his commandments, and they that have the right to the tree of life, that they may enter into the gates, in, uh, in, through the gates into the city, for without, outside the city of God, are dogs. And look who's in the group with the dogs. Sorcerers, and whoremongers, and murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth, and maketh a lie. Those are people left in their sins. The top of the list was dogs. Talking about unsaved people involved in Gentile idolatrous worship. They're out to rob you of the riches of the grace that you have in Christ. And they can seduce you. Somebody will let them have the pulpit to seduce you to do that. The whole point is, the warning that Paul has given us here is, number one, those who are dogs, beware of dogs because they're out to devour you. And the other part of that warning is, don't be like them and eat up anything any religious man says. Don't follow them. Beware of dogs. Read what Paul wrote. Read what God gave us in Christ. Believe the truth of it. Be safe from your sins. And you know that all liars, you better get saved from sin, right? You don't think you're going to work your way into heaven by not telling a lie because you've already failed in that. Even after you get saved, you'll catch yourself telling a lie. Our salvation is by the grace of God, according to the riches of God's grace, we're forgiven of all of our trespasses through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. He paid for our sins. God gives salvation as a free gift to you through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. God gives you eternal life. Don't let someone seduce you into thinking anything else or think that you can lose what God gave you that's eternal because they're just out to rob you of enjoying the riches of God's grace. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for these truths and for the warning and we pray, Father, that what we heard today will be a warning sign to us 
that we'll think about, especially when we hear all the different preachers saying all different things, that, Father, it would be just as big as a warning as if we saw it written in big, bold letters, warning us of physical danger. May we take heed to the spiritual danger that's out there as well. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.